Hey, uh, can I get everyone's attention for a minute here? Is this on? Maybe. All right. Can I get everyone's attention for just a minute here? Uh, does anyone have like questions from like the last lecture? We kind of like rushed it pretty quick um, to try and to try and get as fast into into deep learning as possible. Does other are does people do people have like residual questions or maybe they went back and like looked at slides and now they realize they have there's something that wasn't quite answered. Does anyone have like are there questions, comments, concerns about like previous lecture that we can talk about um, before we get into things today? Um, like I think there was a little bit of maybe confusion on like. Um, uh, like the bias variance trade off, um, that kind of jazz. Um, one hot encodings. Anyone have questions, comments, concerns, any of that? Or are there? Yes, friend? We're not going to talk about it very much. Um, I mean, there's there's like um, there's all different kinds of wait. Um, by exploratory data analysis, do you mean like hyperparameter tuning or do you mean? Um, like how we how we choose all of the, like what form our model takes, all that, or are you talking about just like looking at your data and just a, yeah, so there's like um there's all different kinds of things that we're not really going to cover much here, like like k fold cross validation. It's like stuff you'll learn in one eighty nine or like data one hundred. Um, it's basically for the purposes of this class, you're probably not going to be doing a whole ton of it. Um, but if you want to know how it works, how you would probably go about doing it on your own, you're going to like partition your data into the, the stuff you're going to train on, um, like a chunk you're going to tune on and a chunk that you're going to test on. Um, so you'll have a specific segment of your data that you're just going to like tune with effectively. You're just going to try a whole bunch of different models and stuff, loss functions, see what works best, um, for that data. And then you're going to use that to move on to like your training data and stuff. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. If not, I can, I'm happy to elaborate as well. Okay. Um, we are about at time. Um, so yeah, if anyone if anyone has uh, more questions, I think there's some time that we can take here at the start of this lecture to just um, address them. If there if there are questions in the audience before we get started, yes, friend. So I I just thought training and testing. Why does tuning in training? Because if you um, find, oh Lord, yeah. Um, the whole point is that there's, they're like fully independent of each other. Um, so if you find a, a model that works really good on the segment of your data that you're using just to tune, um, odds are that it's gonna work better than average um, when you actually go to like um, report your final results for your model. Um, so they're they're not entirely independent. The model you chose depended on that data. Um, and you want to make sure that whatever data you're like reporting your results with is like fully independent of the data that you trained on and selected your model with. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Um, are there more questions? If not, we can jump on in. All right, um, party on. So welcome everyone to lecture two. Um, this is going to be a, a bit of, uh, again, another quick lecture. Um, so please feel free to, to stop me if there are questions that you have, things you feel like I haven't fully explained. Um, again, like the first three lectures of this course uh, and technically the fourth one as well are just to get you into deep learning as fast as possible at like breakneck speed. Um, so that we can actually start like learning how to use the tools for deep learning and like playing with stuff. 
Um, so that's, that is sort of a short sort of explainer as to why this is gonna be um, very quick. Um, the hope is that after today, you understand what deep learning models are, uh, the most basic form of deep learning model and um, how we go about training them. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about um, different kinds of models, but we haven't really touched much on like how we actually would go about selecting the best parameters. So we're actually gonna make sure that you know um, what the form, what the function actually looks like in the case of deep learning, as well as how you select the good values of parameters. Um, so will we fast, please feel free to stop me at any point um, and answer, uh, let me take your questions. Um, I just wanted to put that out there before we get started. Um, so on, let me fix my speaker notes. So first we're gonna start with like a little bit of math review. We linked some things that we wanted you all to know before starting uh, this class, but just in case we're gonna go over some of them, like a little bit of the, the linear algebra that we're sort of expecting for this that is gonna be useful later in this lecture. Um, again, this is a, a, a safe space and please feel free to ask questions if you have them. Um, we're gonna talk about the motivation for neural networks. We're gonna talk about neural networks themselves. We're gonna talk about how we train them, gradient descent, um, and talk a little bit about some other building blocks you might want to have, um, bells and whistles for your basic neural network. Um, and then a little bit about why deep learning is used, why, why we, what we have observed um, and why it is so prevalent. So a little bit of math review. Um, vector dot products. This is um, something we want to make sure all y'all are comfortable with. Um, just the idea that if you have two vectors, their dot product, you have a vector of w1, w2, frequently um, using w's for our parameters, and then wn multiplied by another vector, x1 all the way to xn. That if you multiply, if you do this, which is referred to as a dot product, um, that it is equal to x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2, and so on, all the way down, xn, wn. Um, and this is how we notate it. We refer to this vector of w's as a row vector, and the vector of x's as a column vector, um, sometimes shortened to w transpose um, multiplied by x. Does anyone, um, are there questions in the audience about just vector multiplication? Um, and more specifically, this notation, how we get from this written out all the elements to just W transpose X, where W and X are vectors. Okay. Um, then in that case, we're gonna roll on to the next one. Um, the reason we're going through all of these is because we will use them in just a minute. Um, and I just wanna make sure that you're, again, you're fully um, comfortable with, with this conversion from elements in vectors to this shortened vector notation. And if I'm writing too small in the back too, let me know and I can try and write a little bit bigger. Um, so matrix vector multiplication, you can think of a matrix specifically. This is something that probably isn't immediately apparent if you've just taken, you know, like, um, like high school algebra and stuff. You can represent a vector as just a list of row vectors. So this whole guy right here is a vector, just like that vector of written out Ws that we had on the board, another vector, and so on and so forth. And when you multiply that by column vector, you can imagine distributing this column vector to each of your rows and doing a whole bunch of dot products, right? So in the top, you'll have W1, the dot product of W vector W1 in this case, W1 is the first row um, dot product with our X, W2 transpose X all the way down, WN transpose X, where all of our W's and X's here are vectors. Does anyone have questions about specifically how we can um, make matrix vector multiplication compact by representing it as you see on the bottom right? as just a series of dot products between the rows as well as our original column vector. Okay. Um, if there are no questions, then I will move on to the next one. 
Um, don't be scared by this bottom thing. It smells your fear. Um, the, the important thing I want to just talk about um, is just notation, how we sort of like index into our vectors. Um, with neural networks, we're going to be talking about just sort of like black box functions, um, just some magical black box that takes in a vector x. It's tough not writing very well. I apologize. And spinning out perhaps another vector y. Um, and as we start to talk about what's inside this black box um, that makes it quite magical, uh, we will be referring to um, again elements of vectors and. I want to get you comfortable first with notation. So x is often refers to like our input vector to our function, to our magical function that is a function of vectors. We're going to refer to y usually as a label vector. So we talked a little bit about like one hot encodings and how if you're classifying digits and you have 10 different potential output classes, it's convenient or perhaps best to represent the label for the digit three uh, as zero, 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 one, and then a bunch of zeros. So that would be an example of our, our label Y, it's a vector. Um, w is often a matrix of parameters. Every element in the matrix will be a parameter, something that we're trying to learn. B is if we have like a vector, still usually parameters, and then theta is just sort of this shapeless thing that refers to all of our parameters together. In this case, on this slide, um, it is a vector. And when we're subscripting things like a vector B, subscript I, that refers to just a single scalar. Um, because if we have a vector and we index into it and pick something in it, that's just a scalar. Um, things like that, that we can have a vector of parameters. Um, like if W is a is a matrix of parameters, um, or or yeah, our individual elements of W are all just scalars, um, and they are they are parameters individually. Each of these scalars is a parameter that we're trying to optimize. Are there questions in the audience about um, this idea that we can have things like matrices and vectors, um, but all they really do is just contain all of our scalar parameters, just values that we're trying to optimize for? No questions, comments, concerns? OK. Um, so again, don't worry about the thing on the bottom. I just wanted to emphasize that you can have um, vectors of parameters. You can have matrices of parameters. Um, but they're all, all the parameters individually on their own are just scalars, um, just the same as you've seen before. Um, and derivatives of vector functions. So our function, if we have a function here um, that spits out a scalar, if our function is just the dot product between some vector of constants A and another vector that is the input to the function X, uh, there's no reason why we can't just take a derivative of our output with respect to one of the, um, in this case, inputs to our function. Um, so if you have something like this, because at the end of the day, everything that's inside A and X, they're just scalars. There's no reason why we can't take the derivatives of our output, which is a scalar, with respect to like one of our inputs, um, which is also a scalar. And so this is something you can see, A transpose X, is it just boils down to scalar multiplication and addition. Even though it all came inside vectors and matrices, it all boils down to scalar addition. And there's no reason we can't just take, you know, boring old partial derivatives with respect to uh, the inputs. Are there questions about this? Because this is something I really want to make sure we're all clear on. Um, because it just makes life really easy going forward if everyone's on the same page with us. Other questions? All right. Um, so with that in mind, we can start motivating and talking um, about neural networks. I just want to make sure that everyone feels okay about um, notation that we're going to use with all the linear algebra. Um, so why, where does the motivation for a neural network come from? 
So there's like all different kinds of problems that we can solve in machine learning, um, regression, classification, reinforcement learning. And frequently it revolves around super nonlinear functions, like creating in the case, if you're trying to regress onto a polynomial that looks super funky, you're trying to learn something that's like super nonlinear. It doesn't look like a line at all. It's a really complex kind of function that you're trying to model. Um, and we want, we want something that's cap like a universal model that's really good at doing all these different kinds of tasks. Um, and the motivation we want to have for that is like the human brain. The human brain is really, really good at doing all different kinds of tasks. Um, it can classify objects. You can figure out where objects are. They can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and despite the fact that your brain is really just one model that can do all different kinds of things. And we're going to try and take some inspiration from that to figure out, is there some kind of model that we can reuse for all different kinds of tasks down the line? That's just like good out of the box. And your brain has neurons. Um, they're just these little dudes in your brain and they take inputs from surrounding neurons. And depending on what the inputs are, uh, they spit out a value. Um, depending on the sum of all of the inputs into that neuron. Um, and just a fair warning too, this is not the same as CogSci. If you want to take CogSci, that's fine, but don't like be baited into thinking that you're going to get like a special insight into deep learning by taking CogSci. Uh, maybe some people do, but I've yet to hear about it. People just sometimes feel like they got into it because of neural networks and then they felt like they got cheated. <laughs> but we're, we're going to try and take some inspiration from that. Um, so if we want to look at, we're going to first like kind of draw it out, um, like what we want what we want our black box to be. So we're basically gonna try and make sort of like a, a mini brain. And like the simplest form of that is the perceptron. Um, it is a mathematical formulation pretty similar to a neuron. Um, we have a whole bunch of inputs. Um, I figure out where to write this. We have a whole bunch of inputs. Vector, oh, and my backpack has chalk on it. We have a whole bunch of inputs. And we're going to just weight them. Just like the incoming connections from one neuron to another um, will get weighted and then summed up. So we have a whole bunch of inputs in blue, um, x1, x2, all the way to xn. We're going to weight them all and add them and then activate on them with some kind of step function. Um, we're going to hijack this and we're going to replace the step function with a ReLU, which basically on this graphic, you can see for any value less than zero, it spits out zero. For any value greater than one, it's going to spit out the value it took in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's what it ends up looking a little bit like, actually, no, I'm jumping the gun. Um, we're taking in a bunch of inputs. We're scaling all of them by a different value. Our W0 ends up being added, really. Um, and that's B on this slide here. So we have our W0, which we're just going to refer to as B. Um, and then all of our inputs weighted by a different value. So that's really all the perceptron is. But the whole point is that it sort of looks like a neuron. It's pretty close. It's got a whole bunch of incoming connections, and it's got one outgoing connection based off of what all those inputs were. So this is sort of like what a neuron looks like, just taking in inputs, weighting them, adding them and then spitting them out through the Rayleigh function. So this is like just a little demo, basically a toy problem. So if our inputs are, if our inputs are like three, two and one, and we have a bunch of weights, in this case, three, negative one, negative one, and a WZ, W0 or bias term of negative two. We're simply just going to take our first weight and our first value. We're going to multiply them together. The output of all this, we're just going to take our first weight, our first value, nine, next weight, next value, negative two, next weight, next value, negative one. We're going to add them together with our bias. Let's forgot it. Negative two. Add them all together, which should give us four. And then we're going to pass it through the ReLU function. And then 
Sounds sad. We're going to pass it through the ReLU function, which in this case, because the value is greater than zero, it's going to spit out the exact same value it took in. And on the right-hand side, it's the same thing. Only now, all of our weights multiplied are by all of the inputs plus our bias um, sum to a value that's less than one. Uh, and when you pass a value that is, I'm sorry, less than zero. And when you pass a value that's less than zero through the ReLU, it just outputs the same thing it took in. Um, so does anyone have questions on, on this example and how the math works? Or are there questions? Yes, friend. What is what? What is ReLU? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ReLU, it's just a graph up in the top left. It's just a function uh, that just takes in a scalar. Um, and it, what it spits out uh, is the value it took in if x is greater than 0, if x is greater than 0. Otherwise, it just spits out 0. Um, so yeah, so the output graph just sort of looks like that. Fair enough? All right. Um, are there more questions? Yes, friend? Yeah, why is the weight different in the second tree than the first tree? Uh, the weights are arbitrarily chosen. So for every perceptron, it could have different weights okay. and a different bias. They're learned values depending on what you're trying to do. Um, for a different data set, you might learn different values. Um, yeah, they, they're learned values and they can, they can do whatever they want, whatever um, optimizes for our loss function. Are there more questions? All right, if not... Um, so let's figure out how to write this a little bit more compactly because doing all of this like addition is really gross and takes up a lot of space. Uh, an easy way to write this is just as a dot product between all of our inputs and all of our weights and then just adding a little bias term at the end. Um, so you can see that down at the bottom. What we had before is just a whole bunch of x1, xi's by times wi's, and then we just added b. And we're just going to represent that on the right by just a dot product between our vector of weights and our input vector, and then adding just our scalar bias. Does anyone have questions, comments, or concerns about the uh, the way in which I have written this? Because this is going to be used a bunch more. We're gonna we're about to go hog wild here. Okay. Um, so this is this is the effective form uh, formula for it after you've added the ray loop. Um, this is this is the perceptron. This is our simplified simplified model of sort of what a neuron is doing. Um, but your brain has a lot of neurons, and they're all stacked and all over the place. So we're just going to go absolutely nuts. We're going to stack, and we're going to cascade arbitrary numbers of perceptrons. Um, so what we've basically done is for like the top blue circle, um, you can think of that as a perceptron. Um, that top blue circle is a function of all of the inputs before it, all weighted, and then output it again. So we've just taken a whole bunch of perceptrons that we just saw and just stacked them all on top of each other. And then we took the output of all of those perceptrons and then fed them into another stack of perceptrons. We've just gone absolutely nuts. Um, but it's sort of resembling a brain. The top blue guy takes in a whole bunch of things. You can think of the top blue guy as a neuron takes in the output of a bunch of other neurons, um, and then spits out the ReLU activation on that. And then on the right, the green guys take in the output of a whole bunch of neurons that came before them, um, and then you know weight them, weight all of the incoming connections, and spit out a value. Um, so like, let's look just at a single layer, because that's kind of overwhelming by itself. So again, what this is is just a stack of perceptrons. Um, so we can think about just doing the perceptron operation a whole bunch of times. Um, we have a function now of all of the weights of all of our different perceptrons. Um, in this case, the wi are vectors corresponding to the weights of the ith perceptron. And we're just basically going to take all of our independent, just this adding that we did over here, and we're just going to stack them all up, all the outputs, into a vector. Um, only we can shorten that to our previous perceptron notation. So if you look on the far right, it's literally just the perceptron formula a whole bunch of times on the same input. Does anyone have questions? So again, it's just this ReLU function right here. 
and we just stack it a whole bunch of times. Um, the ReLU in this case applies to each of the elements independently. Are there comments? There probably will be, likely. Yes, friend. Uh, so in the original, Yeah, and you've done that a whole bunch of times and you're just stacking it. Yeah, they're they're all taking in the same input, but each perceptron has its own unique weights. Um, can I provide any more clarifications to anyone? And right now, all the yes, products we're doing is just dot product. Yep. It literally just boils down to the dot product. So you can see again on the far right, each element in our vector. It's just the perceptron output. And the perceptron output is yeah, just the dot product with the scalar being added. Um, and you can see each of the biases are different. And each vector of weights is totally different, independent, all that. Are there more questions I can answer? Yes. Uh, so, so is the goal to find all the W or all the W? Yeah, we're going to eventually, when we, when we bring a whole bunch of layers together. Um, you'll see how this works a little bit more, but eventually, yeah, all of, we're gonna try and figure out what a good value is for every single element in every single W and for every single B. But the W again, it just has scalars in it, right? It's not scary. Scalars are like, they're our friends, they're fine. Um, so it it's it is eventually going to just boil down to a whole bunch of scalars just being added and multiplied together. Um, yeah. Um, are there more questions? Okay. Um, so here's like just a sort of toy example again. Um, turn to your neighbor and just talk about this for a minute here. So again, we've notated all the weights um, and you know our input values. And just turn to your neighbor and talk about you know doing the math and what you think the the output will be. Um, make some friends. I get thumbs up if people have if they feel good about this. Yeah, I'll wait it out. 
Oh, and I also forgot to note, but the, the output layer will not have a ReLU on it. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, so if you if you go back and like look at uh, Can I get a can I get a show of thumbs to see uh, how people are feeling about this? Thumbs up and like a, a thumb, not thumbs down, but thumb to the side if you're feeling like you still want more time. Okay. All right. Um, then we will keep going here. Um, so the if you just end up doing this, uh, you get negative three. Um, so the the first logit in the middle, um, when you when you actually calculate its value, it is less than zero. Um, so you're going to end up getting um, the value that is zero. And then the other two, because they are greater than uh, zero, when you pass it through the ReLU, you're going to get the original values, which are five and one respectively. And then the output, we did not apply a ReLU to. Um, and when you just weight all of those values from that we obtained from this middle layer, you're just going to get negative three. Can I get like a show of thumbs to see like how many people got that? It's, it was kind of a lot of basic addition. So if people didn't get it, like the fully expected, because like doing this in my head too is like impossible. <laughs> um, okay, so it looks like, looks like people felt okay with that. Um, so this is, this, this is a very small, very basic neural network. Um, that is what it is. That is what it looks like to compute the outputs um, of our neural network. And if we want to revisit this even more and get our notation even more compact, um, previously we'd listed each element in our output as being the result of uh, a dot product and a single addition. If we compactify this even more and just bring out all of these into just one vector, the dude on the left-hand side is literally just matrix multiplication, a bunch of W dot products with our input X. That's the same thing as just matrix factor multiplication. And again, the ReLU applies to every element individually in this case. So this is the most compact form of a forward pass for a single layer um, of our neural network. That is that is the way to write it. We have we have achieved what we wanted, a very compact way to write one little layer of a neural network. Do people have, yes, friend? Yeah, in the previous example, how do you know the, the ordering of the elements in the factor of negative five and six? Yeah, sorry, it wasn't very clear from this, but I was hoping that it would be the first um, the dude on top corresponded to the first weight, the second uh, output in this middle layer here corresponded to the second weight, and so on. Um, well, this is just me making a crummy little design for it. Uh, normally, normally you'll just represent your weights as like, again, like a row vector, and you'll just notate it as we're doing here, and then there will be no ambiguity. Um, but yeah, good question, and I apologize, this is not... I'm I I will see if I can make better graphics going down going down um as we progress. But uh I hope the I hope the point is clear, the point got across um the the essence of this exercise. Um are there more questions? All right. Um so 
this is a, a little bit of a sidetrack, but so let's talk about like classification. So we have, we have a neural network and we've, this example here that we just did can be scaled up. So we have like many layers and they're even bigger. Uh, and we end up with like millions and millions of weights. Um, so with all this, just, uh, we want to take a short digression and talk about, um, how we would go about like interpreting the output of our model. So in this example, the output was from like negative infinity to infinity, but that's not like super useful if we want to try and like classify a digit. So previously we talked about like what happens if we have a picture with like numbers that go from zero to and including nine. So say this include this is a seven, but maybe it kind of could be interpreted as a two. Um, how say we have like we we talked previously too about we can represent our labels for this as being a uh, one hot representation of this, where we have zeros in all of the places that don't correspond to a seven. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have a one in the sevens place. And we talked about how we maybe want to do something like mean squared error. We want our, our model, our black box, to spit out something that looks like this. But like, how do we constrain that? How can we make sure that we can interpret our model's outputs as like the probability that the model thinks that this is a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, six, a seven? How do we, how can we like with math make sure that the output um, can be interpreted as like our confidence that this is a seven? Um, if our model like is kind of not sure that maybe that's a seven, maybe that's a two, it maybe would do like 50% chance that that's a two. And then a whole bunch of, what is that? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Maybe it's like 50% sure that it's a two. Maybe it's 50% sure that it's a seven. How do we like make sure that our output, our model's output can be like interpreted as, you know, the odds of it being a certain class. Um, and we're gonna use one last operation on the very end of our neural network. Um, that's called softmax. What do we want? We want two things. Um, in order to make sure that our output can be interpreted as like probabilities that this is, you know, um, a seven probability that it's a two, we need to make sure that all the elements sum to one. And we also need to make sure that no value is less than zero or greater than one because having negative one probability is absurd. Um, so those are, we need some kind of function that always outputs a value or a vector um, where all the elements are from zero to one and they add up to one. So what we're going to use is softmax. Don't worry about the formula on the right. It's just, if you want to go back and look at it later, um, what we're basically going to do is maybe our, our network output is like crazy values, like three, 20, negative 50, like insane values. The first thing we're going to do, um, is take the exponential of all of these things. So we're going to take in this case, we're going to use a base of E just because it happens to make the math really nice, but you can use like any value you want. Um, we're going to take E to the three. We're going to just replace our vector E to the three, E to the 20, E to the negative 50. What has this done? All of our elements are now positive. That's a start. Nothing E to the power of any number is always greater than zero. So that's like a start. And the next thing we're going to do with our formula is with all of these values, we're just going to normalize it. So we're just going to take the length of this vector and divide every element by the length of it. So that when you sum all of it up, or not the length of it, I apologize, the sum, um, we're going to sum all of these guys up and divide by the sum so that when you add all these elements up, they're going to sum up to one. Um, so it's very simply just the act of taking all of the outputs of our neural network taking e to the power of all of those individual elements and then dividing by the sum of all of them so that we guarantee that one, everything, first we guarantee that everything is greater than zero. And then second, after we have divided or normalized, um, we've made sure that the sum of all the elements in it are one. Um, and because the sum is one and everything is greater than zero, then we also can see that like no individual element is gonna be greater than one. Um, so does anyone have, sort of questions about that. And it, it sort of, it effectively will make sure 
um, our model will never have like perfect confidence um, unless it outputted like negative infinity for almost every single value. Hence the meme that there will always be, all of our probabilities will be probably, they might be small, but we're never gonna output something that looks like this. It's probably gonna be 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, very small values um, after we've done this operation. Um, not possible, softmax means it's not probable. Um, the largest values will stay the largest after we've taken the softmax. Um, whatever, whatever value is largest after we take the softmax, it will be the largest probability by a good margin. A um, little bit, little bit mathy, but um, I want to know, are people comfortable with that? And the idea that we're just, we have a function here that takes in some value, some vector of values um, and spits out a whole bunch of uh, a vector of values that sum to one and are all greater than one, greater than zero. Okay, sort of a mathy aside. You won't ever have to implement this or worry too much about it, but it's just something you're going to throw on the end of your neural network. So to like recap, we took a whole bunch of perceptrons, um, which are just weighted inputs plus a bias, and we stacked a bunch of up of them up to create a layer, and we just cascaded a ton of them. Um, and that gives us this neural network. And if you want to interpret the outputs of your neural network as like probabilities of different classes, you're just gonna stack, you're just gonna stick on like a soft max operation at the end of it. If you want to do classification, which we will talk about a good bit in this class. Um, so that is that is the forward passive neural network that all of this crazy stuff that's been happening in machine learning boils down to this. Um, that is the essence. And here's how we got here. Just taking the perceptron, notating it as just a dot product plus a little scalar value on the end, stacking a whole bunch of them up um, and forming a matrix matrix vector multiplication. So you can represent a single layer of a neural network. And then cascading a bunch of them, you get something like this for a simple two layer neural network. That is, that is what it all boils down to. Um, so yeah, if anyone, again, if anyone has questions, comments, feel free to stop me um, or I can keep rolling on. Um, so the question was asked while y'all were talking about that example, um, it's like, why do we even bother having this ReLU? If we took the ReLU out of this two-layer neural network, we would get something that looks like this. Um, and at the end of the day, what this boils down to, if you multiply a bunch of matrices together, you get another matrix. And then it's like, why did we even bother with all of these layers? If at the end of the day, if we multiply everything out, it could have just been summed up by a single matrix multiplication in the first place. The reason that we add this ReLU here is to add some kind of complexity to it, to make the function much more complex. Because at the end of the day, again, a weight matrix from one of our layers, W2, multiplied by another matrix, W1, could just be represented by a single matrix in the first place. Um, and it, it adds some necessary complexity that allows us to model all kinds of crazy complex things. Um, so are people feeling OK about why we would need um, these ReLUs in this case? OK. So gradient descent, how do we actually optimize um, our models? So we talked a little bit about loss functions, some kind of metric for like how good or bad the output of our model is doing. And ideally, it is high when our model is doing really poorly, and it's low when our model is doing really good. Um, our model output may be a vector, so we need to make sure that we can handle that, um, that our labels and our outputs can be vectors. And ideally, this also should be like differentiable. Um, we're going to be using a little bit of calculus here. Um, so it's also important that this is differentiable. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is and what that looks like here in a minute. Um, but this is, again, just sort of recapping what we talked about Tuesday. Um, and we talked about like mean squared error. If this is our real output and this is what our model outputs, we just take the difference between every element, square all the differences. And then sum them up. That's not a bad metric for uh, for like how good or bad our model is doing. Because if everything's really close, then you know that means we've probably outputted close to a one, and we've classified this maybe correctly as a seven. Um, it's a loss function that we can use. Um, 
So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, make a metaphor here. If you're on a hill and you want to go to the bottom, but you can only see like one foot around you, what are you going to do? The best move you can do is you're probably just going to take a step in the steepest downward direction. If you want to get to the bottom of that hill, since you can't really see everything around you, you're probably just going to take a couple small steps um, in the direction of steepest descent. Stop, reevaluate, figure out, okay, has the direction of steepest descent changed? And then keep on trucking. So we're going to use this as, this is, this is how we're basically going to optimize our neural network. Um, we have a very complex it's a vector function, really. Um, and the steepest or um, the steepest direction in this case is the gradient of, of any kind of vector function. This is something you learn in multivariable calculus. Um, if you have some kind of function of multiple variables and you want to figure out at any given point what the steepest direction is, you're going to take the gradient of that function um, with respect to its inputs. And if you want to follow the, the steepest descent, you're going to take the negative of that gradient. Um, just this idea of, of hill climbing and how it applies to uh, multivariable calculus. Um, in calculus, again, just your steepest ascent, the direction you can step in that will cause the greatest upward change is the gradient. And likewise, the opposite direction, the negative of that um, is the direction of steepest descent. Um, so this is hopefully something y'all have seen in, in math before. Um, if you're not comfortable with why this is the case, feel free to check out Khan Academy. It has good examples for why the gradient is the steepest uh, direction that you can step in. So we have a complicated, admittedly, function um, of what are effectively scalars. So we have a function, our loss function, spits out a scalar. And all the dudes inside all of our Ws, all of our Bs, they're just scalars, right? It's not really substantially different from just a normal function written out, right? Of like x1, x2, that are all scalars. It's not substantially different from a multivariable calculus problem um, in that all of these elements inside our Ws, our Bs, whatever, um, they end up just being scalars. And our output is a scalar. Um, and is our we just take our data here as constants um, that you don't you you don't take derivatives of. Um, so what we have here is just kind of a complicated looking calculus problem. If you want to figure out what is the best way we can change our weights, since it's really hard to figure out like on at face value what is the best value of these weights that would optimize and give us the minimal loss, that's like a really hard problem. So frequently we're lazy and what we'll just do is we'll just initialize all of our weights, all of our biases to be completely random and then just say, okay, we can't see everything. We don't know where the best place is, but we can kind of see which is a good direction to step in. It ends up being just the same thing. We're gonna take the gradient of our loss function with respect to all of these scalar parameters and we're just going to step them in a direction of steepest descent. And we're just going to step with the idea that hopefully our loss, if we're taking steps that are small enough, measured enough, and we'll keep, we keep evaluating where the new direction of steepest descent is, um, that if we keep doing this over time, we will ideally come to a good selection of weights and biases. This is sort of unintuitive because again, like if our weights and biases are, if we have millions of weights and biases, uh, this is a, a million dimensional gradient function and a million dimensional hill. So I encourage you not to try and visualize it like that. Um, but I hope you, you understand that in multivariable calculus, when you have, again, um, a gradient of some much higher dimensional function, it's still the direction of, of steepest ascent. And if you move in that direction, it will be the steepest increase in your function's output. So we, again, here, we've just written it out explicitly. The first weight matrix, its first element. And then so on, the second weight matrix, um, its last element. All of our uh, bias vectors, all those individual scalars, that's what our loss function is a function of. And there's no reason why we can't just turn it into a you know math 53 problem. Um, 
So let's explicitly write out how we take these little steps here. Um, and I should note again, the gradient vector, what it ends up being is just the partial derivative of our output, the output of our function, which is L here, um, with respect to all of the inputs. And our inputs here are parameters, right? Um, it ends up just being the partial derivative of our loss function with respect to all of our individual parameters. You can think of it just stacked up. And then we'll worry about reshaping it later to match the shapes of all of our weights and biases. This is kind of an unintuitive concept. So I imagine there's questions. Um, and this idea that we're just going to basically step down the hill. We're going to figure out which direction we can move all of our weights and biases so that maximally decreases our loss function. Yes, friend. Yeah, yeah. That's base. Wait, did you say how or would you? Yeah. How? Um, I mean, this is just a, a continuous function, right? Um, so you can take partial derivatives of the output with respect to the input. Um, it's an it's a very complex, very high dimensional function. Um. But it's all continuous at the end of the day. I mean, you, we'll talk about this more in the next lecture, how you would actually take those partial derivatives. But uh, the bottom line is like, do you buy, do you believe me if I say that like, since everything in here is like fully continuous um, or entirely differentiable, that there's no reason why um, you can't measure a small change in the output if you make a small change in the input. Does that sort of scan? Yeah. We're, we'll talk more about how you do it later, but yeah. The, the ways and biases are you for each of the steps on. Yep. So just one loss function. Yeah. Well, I mean, our loss function, if we choose different weights and biases, our function is going to have different outputs, correct? So our loss function is going to change. So in a certain sense, our loss function depends on all of our parameters, um, which is why we can just think of this as just a standard multivariable, you know, math 53 um, calculus problem. Um, where we're just taking the derivative of some f of x, y, z, w, whatever, um, with respect to those input values, x, y, z, w. Yes, friend? So since you're looking at like this, this set, right? Like this, yeah. And then we're going to backtrack and walk in the opposite direction. Okay, so you found that some other function that was in your way. Well, yeah. Well, here's what it is, basically. We're going to, we have all of our parameters. And we're going to evaluate. We're going to take the derivative um, of our loss function with respect to those parameters, evaluate it at their current value. I just want to point out that this is the correct notation, and like we don't really care about what the like symbolic derivative is. Um, we're just going to look at the value of our parameters right now. We're going to look at those weights, um, and I guess it, you're jumping the gun a little bit, but then we're going to update them. We're going to take some small step, um, the size of our step here being scaled by theta or not theta lambda. We have all of our parameters, um, and we're just going to take that small little step corresponding to um, the component of that gradient. Um, we're going to take that small step scaled, again, by something called our learning rate, which is lambda. Rats, I'm running over time. Um, are, there, are there questions about this idea of like the gradient update? And we have all of our parameters theta. We've taken the the gradient here is just the vector of the partial derivative of L with respect to all the individual components that went into our function. And we're just making this, this little increment. We're moving in the opposite direction of greatest change. Um, are there questions, comments, concerns about this still that I can answer? And again, just it effectively boils down to just taking the gradient. Um, of our loss function, L, with respect to all of our scalar parameters, um, which again is, is hopefully not substantially different from things you've maybe seen before in like vector calculus. Only now there's just a lot more inputs. Uh, but it is, still, it is still the same thing at the end of the day. So this is how we make a gradient update. If we're just looking at like one little tidbit of data and one output, this is how we can step so that we can make uh, the biggest decrease in our loss function. Um, on that example. So if we saw that example again, after making this little update to our weights, um, we would get significantly decreased loss on this one example. Um, that, is, that is the hope. Um, 
And we need to make sure that our Lambda, our learning rate is like small enough because if we're taking two biggest steps, then we're gonna like, we're gonna overshoot. And then all of a sudden we're, we're gonna find ourselves going up the hill again. Um, so just by taking small measured steps, um, we should see a decrease in our loss function on this one example. Only the thing we really care about is that our loss decreases across all of our data. So now that we've talked about how we would like step our weights in order to decrease the loss on one example, we basically need to figure out how to do that for like all of our examples. And if you do the math, what it turns out is that if you just take the gradient of every single training example and you just average it, that will be the step in which you can take, um, that will result in the, the largest decrease in your loss over your entire data set. So this is really the, the direction we, we kind of want to end up stepping to make sure that we're decreasing the loss for our entire data set. So if we run our entire data set again um, and measure the, the average loss, um, it'll be hopefully a lot smaller than, than the last time before we updated our weights. This is sort of, again, a bit of a confusing concept, but um, my hope is that you will believe me in that we can take the gradient, we can simply average the gradients across all of our training examples. Um, and just to recap, what it's simply going to be is you're going to take every single parameter, you're going to take the partial derivative, um, evaluate it at every single training example um, with respect to every single parameter, and you're just going to subtract off that partial derivative, the average of all the partial derivatives across all of our data. Um, you're taking the gradient on every single example and stepping by a consistent amount um, for every single example, updating your weights, and then trying again. It's kind of a lazy method because there isn't really a good way to concretely find the best value of all the weights and biases for the neural network. I'm going to move a little bit quicker here. Hopefully, y'all can review the slides or ask questions on EdSTEM um, because I don't want to keep you too long. Um, but if you want to do this in a more computationally efficient way, you're going to, instead of taking this across your entire data set, you're going to chunk it up and just look at little chunks and hope that they're a good approximator for your entire data set. And this is called like batch gradient descent. So rather than doing this for your entire data set, taking gradient steps for your entire data set, just do it for like a little bit of your data set and hope that it's like about as good or about accurate. And the idea is that as we get closer and closer to the bottom of the hill, we're going to slow down. We're going to take smaller and smaller steps um, because the, the value of our gradient will decrease as we slowly come to a little local minimum. Um, I'm going to skip this part on network building blocks. Um, you're allowed to pick different loss functions. You're allowed to pick different values, different activation functions other than the ReLU. Um, because at the end of the day, all we care about is that our loss function quantifies how good or bad we're doing. And there's many ways to do that. And there's many ways to make sure that all of our weight matrices multiplied together don't end up being a single matrix multiplication. You can add a ReLU. You can add all different kinds of things to make sure that the, uh, the function stays complex and wild looking. Um, yeah. Let's see, I apologize for being over time, but I want to get to this here. Um, why, why does this work? We have, we have empirically found that the bigger you make your networks, um, instead of overfitting at a certain point, you end up getting better accuracy. Normally you would start to overfit. Um, you would start to just memorize your training data. And that would end up um, with you getting really, really bad loss on data you haven't seen before. But it has been observed, effectively, the bigger you make your network, at a certain point, you stop not overfitting, but um, you start observing low loss, even though you have the capacity to effectively memorize your data if you wanted to. And it's, it's a strange phenomenon that we don't fully understand, um, but big networks go burr, is, is what has been empirically found. So we've talked a little bit. Unfortunately, I went a little bit over time. I went a little crazy with ask, or, uh, answering questions. Um, but you now know what a neural network looks like. All of these crazy things that you've been hearing about, this is what it boils down to. It's just matrix multiplication at the end of the day um, with some nonlinearity like a ReLU. Um, and you're simply just going to step in a direction that we think is going to decrease um, our loss across our data set maximally, and that's how we optimize it. Um, and your job as an ML engineer is going to be to pick the number and the type of layers in question. We'll talk about different types later. Um, you're going to pick how many layers you want them, you want how big they're going to be, and whether you choose to use something like a ReLU or something different, um, so long as it isn't, uh, you know, 
so long as it's going to make sure that we can't just multiply all of our matrices together to get some trivial uh, linear model. And a lot of it just comes down to trial and error. So you're going to have to just tune for this kind of thing and figure out um, which values, how many layers, how many uh, activations at each layer, which ones work best for that data set. Um, so that is my hope now that you sort of have a, a grasp of how the forward pass of a neural network looks and how we kind of optimize for this. So I apologize, I ran out of time and had to rush the end there. Um, but yeah, feel free to come and ask questions. Otherwise you can go home. We will try and have the quiz out as soon as possible. Um, it won't be insane, I promise. It'll be on Gradescope eventually. I just haven't found time to upload it yet. I apologize, that's my bad. Yeah, sorry, I had to rush that at the end. I got on nerve. Are you recording? I am. So hopefully it's.